Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute. Really pleased to be joining you at this uh, final session of the Massey Cities Summit and to talk really about the implications of federalism and the Constitution. And I'm so interested to hear from these four who have been listening, hanging on every word that's been uttered uh, by the uh, impressive roster of presenters over the last three days and also all the people in the chat and such a great constituency of folks and uh, Canadian Urbanist who's been really pleased to be partnering with Massey on this and with the support of Maitri and Shirk to, to bring the, these ideas, as I said to Natalie in a text this morning, you know, 20 years ago when there were some folks kicking around trying to talk to this, there were about five people. And now uh, there's multiples of that. And uh, the other thing that I just want to comment on is how youthful so many of the presenters have been and how encouraging that is for those of us that feel that we've been at it a bit of a long time. So uh, that's all good. And uh, it's really been a terrific kind of focus. And, and I think just saying, I'm sure that uh, nobody realized just how scintillating academics could be when it comes to talking about the C word, the constitution. So um, hats off to all of you. Um, the Canadian Urban Institute in the connective tissue business. We engage with people in, involved in city building from coast to coast to coast. And uh, I happen to be in Toronto today. Uh, I can't ever, uh, dis I can't claim to be anywhere else because people now recognize my preserved collection. So they know I'm in my dining room <laughs> in Toronto, uh, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the credit the Wendat peoples, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Anishinaabek, um, and it's also home to many diverse First Nations and Inuit folk, and um, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, and covered by two treaties, the Williams Treaty and Treaty 13. Um, we have at CUI continued to struggle, and I know that in this conversation over the last three days, as have you, with the um, the degree to which traditional urbanism has been exclusionary and the way in which colonization shaped that and now racism has shaped that and we see it every day. CUI is very engaged in COVID um, action and COVID recovery and you can just see every fissure that exists often around racial and class lines is manifesting right before our eyes in terms of uh, the impact of COVID. So um, it's a it's always a moment where we just have to acknowledge this, that we're not out of the woods yet, uh, and that these are all uh, conditions and circumstances that pre-existed COVID. And now here we are really full frontal trying to cope with and come to terms with this. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you four are going to say about this level of conversation around rights, around rules, around democracy, all the concepts you've been touching on to make it real for us and to make it real for your audience here who um, want to know whether we can actually make a difference in people's lives. Is this just a theoretical conversation or how do we make a difference in people's lives? So before we get too far into the conversation, I'm going to turn now to uh, the mayor of Toronto, um, who uh, has uh, offered uh, his wishes for this uh, discourse and his encouragement. So Jamie, if you'll play the message from Mayor Tory, and then I'll come back to this group. Hello, Mayor John Tory here, extending my warmest greetings to all of the attendees of the Massey Cities Conference. It's unfortunate that we were unable to host you here in person, right here in the city of Toronto, but I am glad that you have found the space virtually to carry on these very important conversations and no doubt to help bring important change to fruition in cities. Cities are, as we know, it's known the world over, cities are the drivers of economies and the drivers of social change. And while the pandemic has caused great hardship, it has also served as a salient reminder of the force for good that cities can be, from wraparound pandemic responses to spearheading dynamic social change. As Mayor of Toronto, I'm delighted to see that the academic sector is still fostering and supporting the study of cities so that we can learn more from one another and grow in tandem. Toronto's like all the other cities around the world. We know that we must have the resources and the power, the mandate, to fulfill our mandate and best serve our citizens, especially our marginalized citizens. Not only now, but to ensure that we're doing everything in our power to build together because the well-being of future generations depends on some of the work that we do today and carry forward. That legacy is also our responsibility. Cities matter to our future. They will be the backbone of our pandemic recovery and they will be the backbone of our success going forward in this country and in many others. I have no doubt that with your great minds and our collective work that we can foster a world and cities that leave no one behind. 
With that, I wish you all a wonderful conference. I look forward to welcoming you in person in future years to our great city when we're on the other side of this pandemic. Have hope that day is coming. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks, Mayor Tory, for that uh, message. Um, I, uh, the, this mayor has been quite active in discussing more power and authority and resources for cities for during his tenure. And uh, of course, he comes from the provincial legislature as well, so he's very familiar with those issues. And uh, um, we appreciate that it, that we've had several mayors. How many mayors would you have had, Alan? Have you had nine or ten mayors probably participating over the last three days? So you've had um, a blend of practitioners and yep. right. Yeah, current and um, former, nine mayors, yep. Yeah, and former, right. And uh, so that's been an interesting perspective, you know, from a practitioner point of view. So, um, and I think this is part of, you know, Massey has a long tradition of these kind of stimulating this kind of discourse. So, uh, Principal De Rossier, hats off to you that you're continuing to advance that rich tradition that the Massey community has been engaged in and to broaden it into an area where you actually happen to be one of the world's leading experts. So, um, so actually, I might go to you first. I told you, Alex, I'd change it up. I'm going to go to the principal uh, first to just give us a little bit of a picture of what you've been hearing and what you think the sort of salient things are. And don't worry, I'm coming back to everybody lots. So you don't have only one kick at the can yeah. here. Just a couple of opening thoughts and then maybe we'll go to Texas after you. Go ahead. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, Mary. And thank you to all the presenters and all the student uh, rapporteur and, and the great audience that we've had uh, over the last one. I'll, I'll make thanks at the end, you know, uh, to everyone that uh, made this possible. But I just want to say, um, you know, my theory of change is we live in a deliberative democracy and ideas matter and discussing ideas, pushing them out, debating them is really important. And I was so pleased when uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Ratna uh, Omidvar uh, in one of her session, I think Marianne Valverde was there as well, always said, well, if we don't ask the question now about the role of the sea, when will we, you know? So there's this idea that we may be at a, a time, and I think uh, May Mayor uh, Tori just said so. Uh, and so did the President uh, Gertler at the beginning. I think uh, we've had, uh, I think uh, Patricia Popelier this morning said, this is the century of the city. And then obviously Rand Herschel has been so eloquently describing this deafening silence in Canadian constitution about the, about the city. So I think it was important to have that conversation. Happy that it got the way it was so rich, so many dimensions. I have lots to say uh, about what I've learned over the last three days, but I wanna, I just wanted to say what was so clear to me, two, three points, quick point. Number one, not only city matters, but local democracy matters. You know, it came, I think, to in one of your session, Mary, where uh, Jean-Pierre Embassy explained that people won't trust government, all government, if their local governments don't work well. And I and I thought that was important to, to remind uh, <laughs> higher levels of governments that if local democracy doesn't work, everybody loses because the sense of trust and the sense of the ability, because things around you don't work. So you no longer trust government uh, uh, generally. So I thought that was really interesting. I also thought that the link to history was clear when Mary Eberts and uh, Jean-Christophe Bédard-Rubin says, oh yeah, the reason why we have uh, responsible governments probably because they wanted municipal they needed municipalities to exist and to be uh, democratic institutions. Otherwise we, we would not have democratic uh, uh, responsible government. So. Anyway, so it matters. Uh, so that was reassuring. Um, it's quite clear to me that we're, there's two different projects here. There is the bottom-up project that's so important. Like we want powers to municipalities and to cities, but it has to be in the public good. It has to be about uh, you know in, include you know decolonizing. It has to be about everyone. And it it really was to me. It was quite clear that this project we want a human rights city. We just don't want to give power just for the same old reasons, you know. So, so that's clear, and that I think will require a little bit more work to. And then obviously the the other project is the one that I'm more familiar with, and that is the the intricacies of of dealing with different uh, government levels and so on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I I think that. The idea that we don't want more powers to cities if they're not going to do it well. So accountability will be part of it, uh, and and it's I think it it's uh, important to to pay attention to that aspect of this conference. Thanks, Natalie. 
I'm, I'm interested whether, I, I know in, in one of the sessions that I did, there was chat in the chat box about the risks of, of, you know, I'm a localist. I'm always preaching, go to the local, devolve, decentralized subsidiarity, you know, but are there risks because NIMBY happens at the local? What happens yeah. if the local perspective is too narrow, if mm -hmm. it's a gatekeeping perspective? And, and also, as you just suggested, um, you know, I think historically there's been some distrust of local governments that yeah. if you've ever lived rural, for instance, and you've seen the dynamic that can exist on a county council. Um, it's not a particularly inclusive, progressive one. And uh, so I think people have this ambivalence, you know, uh, if you give more power to the local, are you actually going to be progressive or not? Or are you going to be regressive? So I, I don't know whether we got to the end of that. But Richard, I'm going to come to you next uh, because you're going to win the prize for the tidiest backdrop for sure. And you should come and you, if you came to me, you put all my preserves in alphabetical order, I bet you. But, but you and I are both uh, standing desk people, right? You're a standing and I'm a stander. Um, and you've got a, such a great binational perspective. So I'm interested to hear what your observations have been of the sessions you were on and the sessions you've been listening to and how you want to sort of tweak the conversation going forward. Yeah, well, thank you. And first, Mary, thanks to you for chairing this session, but, but all the others you've done, you've contributed so much to the life and success of this conference, and we're, we're so grateful to you. I don't think anyone is a better moderator um, than, than you, so, so thank you for that. Um, I've been struck by um, the synergies that I've heard between empowering cities and empowering people, and I wonder whether there is an inherent connection there. So in the session, one of the sessions that I was involved with, we're talking about how to change the constitution of Canada to devolve more powers to cities. And time and again in the comments, it was, well, what about the people? Are the people gonna be involved? And this dovetailed very nicely with a comment made very early on by Professor Valverde, who suggested that we use citizens assemblies, constituent assemblies, to try to rethink the constitutional arrangements in Canada. And I don't think, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there's a very deep and intricate connection between devolving powers to cities and then empowering the people to be involved in reshaping, reimagining their constitutional arrangements. And I want to just pick up on a point that uh, Nathalie made just a moment ago when she invoked, I think for me, is one of the words of the conference, which is deliberation. And I see in the list of attendees, we have Hoi Kong here in the room joining us. He's one of the great scholars of deliberation theory. There's a book coming up, in fact, just next month on deliberative peace referendums. But I've learned a lot from Hoy's work on deliberation, and there's a value inherent in deliberation. It's not just getting people to decide an issue. It's empower people with information, with opportunities to debate, with opportunities to gather, and then to discuss, to deliberate, in fact, and then to chart their common future. And so that, for me, was really prominent in many of the discussions that I sat in on and that I led over the past three days. Thanks, Richard. You know, I'm old enough to remember when nobody used the word hybrid. Anybody remember that? I think the only way we used hybrid was when we were talking about grains of corn. Anybody remember this? Hybridized seeds. There's this kind of seed. Alex is shaking her head. No rural roots in Alex. That there was hybrid vegetables. But now we talk about hybrid everything. And I, when Mariana made that point about citizen, citizen assemblies, I, I feel like we've made, sorry, I feel like we've made this constitution a big hairy deal. You know, there is a constitution. It is a book. It has chapters and sections. And, and then people say, well, wait a minute. Maybe there are hybrid versions of this. Alex, this is kind of your lifeblood here. You're a pusher of creative thinking. No rule is too uh, strict for you to rethink. So tell me what you've been observing in terms of this kind of mashup of governance. Well, first of all, I'm I'm amazed that I'm being thought of as somebody who's super creative and a shaker upper. So thank you for See? that uh, compliment. I really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to note, because it's relevant to what I'm going to say, that I'm joining you not just from the current cherry blossom capital of Canada, but also um, the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, so I am amazed 
at how many smart city governance nerds are willing to join Zoom for three days straight. Um, I love the comments and the 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 just the dialogue that's happening in chat. I mean, isn't it cool? Like it makes me realize how boring my lectures are that I'm not saying seeing the same energy in you my know chat room. You, you know what, Alex, this is one of those questions that we have to kind of, I hope we'll pivot to sometime about the benefits of COVID. That, yeah. it, that it threw us into, I mean, we had this technology, we could have been using it, but we weren't. And now we've been thrown into it. And as you say, you can get the whole country and other countries expertise engaged for an hour or 20 minutes or three hours on a topic. It's really fantastic, isn't it? It's amazing. Like when we were planning this, we've been working together for a year now, year plus planning this, uh, this event and the, 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 you know, the podcast and the things that are going to come after this event. Um, and this is really what we hope for, you know, at the, at the early days of COVID that we could meet in person and nerd out together. And we're really able to nerd out in this forum, which is super exciting. Um, and with not too many uh, lawyer jokes, which is also you know, <laughs> surprising. And uh, uh, wait, you know, listen, we're not over. It ain't over till it's right. over. I, I, yeah. I'm sure we can pull a few out if you're feeling deprived. Mm -hmm. The thing, though, that really grabbed me is that on one hand, um, you know, municipalities are clearly the most visible sites of democracy. You know, we've had many, many panels that have talked about, um, you know, the fact that big cities in particular but also, you know, other uh, important cities that might not be the biggest in terms of populations are sites of indigenous peoples, um, highly um, creative policy initiatives. Um, in our bigger cities, it's where our most diverse populations live. So they're very highly visible. There's a lot of demands of, of city governments to be accountable, to be transparent, um, to have bottom-up decision-making. But then if you look to the constitution and we heard this time and time again, they're invisible sites for municipalities. We heard that word invisible time and time again. And so I guess just what really struck me is that law itself, coming back to the lawyer jokes, you know, the law isn't necessarily the place we need to be looking for creative solutions, right? And that's, I think what was so exciting about the panels that we saw is that we moved away from a textual reading of the constitution into much more nuanced and interesting arguments from outside of the law. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is the question, that, I mean, you see what I mean? You just, you just fulfilled exactly what I said, that you're thinking creatively about rules. So uh, I think what guides us you know, we have this in, in urban life all the time about rules. What's the role of rules? Permissive zoning, performance-based codes, zoning. You, you can do this, you can't do that. And even this notion, which did surface on our session, I think the one that Jean-Pierre was on, what would happen if, or maybe it was the subsequent one with the mayors, sorry, they're blending for me, but to, if they're blending for me, they surely must be blending for you guys. Uh, what would happen if you started to indicate what the things you can't do and then let let the municipalities everything else they can figure it out alan do you do you see that we might be moving to a more flexible approach to governance is that kind of one of the directions you think we might be going in as a result of the last couple of days what do you think what struck me i guess is that when we started this process um last fall um we started with podcast and so we had not just the 10 mayors that we had you know over the last three days we had groups of mayors for four different podcasts. And I remember Don Iveson saying, it's something he's, he's said numerous times, that he felt that cities were sitting at the kids' table when it came to discussions with the feds and, and the provinces. Um, but something Ed Holder said this morning, and this morning's sessions was, and it made me kind of rethink the way I'm, I'm looking at this whole process, was instead of us going, John Tory called it, in short pants to Queen's Park asking for money. Ed Holder from London said, it should be the other way around, that we have to get the provinces and the federal government to come to the community table, to, not the kids table, the community table, the local table, and see what they need to do to support cities. So what the last three days have shown me is that there is an awful lot of people willing to do the research to look at legal precedents, to look at creative thinking on how to do these kind of things, but there is a there's a there's a, a swell of of people, mayors, 
regular people, civil society groups that want to make this change? How do you how do you bring those you know groups all together to move this whole notion of cities mattering in Canada, you know, forward? And I guess that's what I took out of the last three days. Hmm. Richard, are you a lawyer too? I am. Yes. Okay, so Alan, you're not a lawyer, right? Absolutely not. Nope. But I was just, if Richard weren't a lawyer, I'd be able to say, well, on my screen, the two women on the bottom are the lawyers. And then Richard, I thought you were a political scientist. Oops, sorry. But um, so I'm interested, you know, I guess the question is, it's back to, can we make a tool work for us? And Natalie, this is really, I think, part of the dilemma is that the Canadian narrative around constitution is that it's just untouchable because of Quebec and that it's not a flexible document. Um, my colleagues in the US, you know, my counterparts who work on these issues, the head of the US Civic League, for instance, he said to me, he's in Texas, he's in your town, Richard, he said, you know, every local leader in, in the United States is working around the US Constitution every day. You know, he said it's just part of how we organize our lives down here. We work around whatever the obstacle is. Do you think workarounds, have we reached a point where workarounds aren't going to do it? And we actually do need to have a fundamental change, or is there a hybrid thing, governance, yeah. other models? What do you think? Well, I'm a, I'm always in the hybrid uh, thinking, which is you never choose one basket. You work on all fronts if you want to achieve anything. So uh, I think the the idea behind this conference was to just to explore all avenues. You know, what's possible within. Uh, and I think we got lots of good ideas, you know, I mean, you know, there are lots of ways we want to kind of uh, go a little deeper about, you know, the living tree doctrine, the subsidiarity being, you know, all sorts of little doctrine that we want to push. Uh, Mary Jennigan had some ideas about, about the equalizations for municipalities, you know, so that was part of the problem. I also wanted, I was very clear that I really wanted to invite Quebec constitutional scholars to be part of this conversation because they care as well and they have the similar problems with Montreal. So, so it's important to, to bring people to start opening their minds, start paying attention to that. And then uh, as uh, because Richard is part of this team was, well, we can't, if it doesn't work and also to put pressure on change from within, mm -hmm. you need to have an option of if it doesn't work, those are the options outside. These are the options of pushing for constitutional amendment. So I think we need both uh, mm -hmm. to always uh, uh, have more than one option. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, so so that was the point of it. Uh, and and it's not only about more power. It's also more accountability and more responsibility. I think that's mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you know, so my sense is at the end of this project, there's there's certainly continue to be academic projects. We need to d dig in and we'll publish the book. We'll, but there is a political project and is a public engagement project mm -hmm. that needs to happen. And I, so I'm, I, uh, and I think we, you know, we should think about, and I hope that uh, everybody that participated in this conference will have suggestions about, you know, next steps that could get could be undertaken by all of us in our different spheres you know you know in, in my old world that that what you just heard there was an altar call <laughs> which is <laughs> if you can help put your hand up come to the front um and i know we've got 100 people here listening and then lots lots more will watch subsequently and these things build momentum as they go a couple of quick uh, comments you know jean pierre from the african yeah. urban uh uclg yeah. in africa he did say it's got to be both, right? It's got to yeah. come up from the ground and there's got to be enabling from the top. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the adage where that's what I'm hearing, the teeter-totter that you're living in, Natalie. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, I hope um, that uh, lots of people on this call who are of a certain age will remember this, that back to Massey, that the Jane Jacobs gave a Massey lecture yeah. yes. called A Question of Separatism. Mm -hmm. And it was basically making the case for letting Montreal go and breaking the constitution because the city would flourish uh, if it were allowed to be, if, if the province were allowed to be independent. And uh, that made in a, a permanent friend for Jane of Jacques Parizeau. So there's a, a long, interesting, complicated history here in this country about how do you actually have this, this conversation and can you have it differently from the urban perspective? Richard, you, you um, on a session we did in City Talk months ago said we need provincial constitutions. I'm sure that's had lots of juice over the last couple of days. Do you still think that's the solution? 
Well, I've 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 discovered from today's panel and, and other readings that it's it's really complicated. Uh, I think it sounds. Well, good. there you go. I'm glad you. I'm glad you've chalked that one up. <laughs> once good. you uh, once you really dig into the details, it, it's complicated. But I don't think that is reason to be discouraged about that as a possible option. In fact, what this conference is, in my view, is simply an effort to build a stronger coalition for those who believe that cities should have more powers to help them do the things that we need them to do. And on that front, Mary, what I was really excited about was that in the invitations that we issued for people to participate as speakers, we invited people whose core work is about municipalities and cities, but also people have just good ideas and invite them to think about cities. And so this is now expanding the scope of those who have this in their arsenal, in their repertoire, and that's coalition building. So you have people who think about this and write about this and talk about this all the time. And so that group is growing now to include those who are now beginning to think about it, to bring to bear their expertise, right? And their interests onto cities. And so that's how I think the movement, uh, if it is a movement, mm -hmm. is going to continue to, to grow. So I was really excited about, about that because that was one of the one of the, parts of the visions that we had for, for the program. I mean, it is interesting that 20 years ago, um, maybe we didn't have the same national recognition that we now have that the economy nationally is driven by cities. We didn't have the same level of uh, civil rights and human rights agitation that we now have through the indigenous community and the anti-black racism movement and Black Lives Matter. So maybe there's, and we didn't have the sort of economic, we didn't have the indicators that so showed the economy of the country concentrated in six metropolitan areas, for instance. So I wonder if all those factors contribute to it now being, as you say, a much broader conversation. But Richard, when you look at the mishmash, you're trying to build a movement, a movement for change, let's say, what do you think of specific kinds of tools? So John Sewell, former mayor of Toronto, longtime advocate for the city charter movement is put into the chat. Is, it a, is, it, is a charter city a mechanism? Richard, what do you think of that? And then I'll come to Alex and see what she thinks. Go ahead. I think a charter city is a fabulous idea, uh, not least because it doesn't require a mega constitutional amendment to do. You must use something that people refer to as the bilateral amendment formula in the constitution of Canada, which requires negotiation between parliament and the province that wants to authorize the creation of a charter city. Now, that's not easy to do, but it's much easier than getting all the partners- All, all the leaders to say yes. To agree. Yeah, Alex, did you, were you on the session yesterday that I had with the mayors where Mayor Bowman said, we just need, we need one premier who's willing to take a risk. And we did see in Alberta, we almost had two charters in Edmonton yeah. and Calgary and then dashed. And we have a, ostensibly a charter in Vancouver. We have an urban development agreement in Vancouver. We have the city of Toronto act. Mm -hmm. Is it enough? There are people that would say all well and good to have the city of Toronto act, but that, but the mayor has not chosen to exercise all the powers he's entitled to. And I don't know whether or not citizens would say or residents would say Natalie, that the city is willing to be fully accountable. I say that knowing that there are several City of Toronto ex and current employees on the chat box. They're going to have at me. Alex, what do you think? Can we tweak these things or should we just try a whole bunch of different things? So I think maybe just one thing to clarify um, is that, you know, we've heard terms like cities are policy makers and, and policy takers. And I think we have to remember that cities have multiple roles. So they are representative governments. They're also service delivery agents. They deliver a lot of services that the provincial government has responsibility for. They're also sites of innovation, of pushback, of bottom-up democracy. They are, um, those are the three main ones. And each of those might have a different fix, right? So when it comes to things like being a site of innovation or caring about the citizenry, the fix isn't a piece of provincial legislation. The fix is human rights instruments. And we see many cities that are binding themselves to human rights instruments like UNDRIP, for example, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Maitri, one of the hosts of this event is talking about human rights cities. And there are cities across the world that have bound themselves to human rights codes to, to note that this is an important value. But on the flip side, when it comes to protecting and insulating the city from um, interference by other levels of government, I think that gets at the question you're talking about, Mary, which is what do we need there? 
And this is where I think, you know, we've had a bit of a like chisel rather than hammer approach, you know, mm -hmm. like one off legal cases that have gone to the Supreme Court, including the one that is in that was just heard at the Supreme Court. Now, that's a chisel, right? It's not yeah. going to make an enormous difference. So, it, so what did you think of, of Brian's idea? Like, do you just do you just want to find one premier that says, OK, I'll give it a go? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think we can be innovative. Like there's a tendency in Canada, I think to A, want to have one model that's going to work everywhere. No, <laughs> we are a, a landscape that is incredibly different across this country, across yeah. the territories that comprise it, across the Indigenous nations that are at the basis of our cities. So no, we can't have one model. And the second is we have a real reticence to change, right? So I think actually Richard's um, push that really needs to be called out about a much more flexible constitution, whether it's a provincial constitution or a federal constitution that recognizes that you're not gonna come up with the right model when you change the overarching law. I think we need to remember that too. We are, we, we can innovate on a consistent ongoing basis. We can try stuff. I mean, you know, ur ur urbanists understand pilots. It's the way that it's the way yeah. most things happen now. And she just, oh, let's run a pilot. And funny that the pilot stays in. Um, Natalie, you talked about two parallel campaigns, a public campaign, and then a sort of, you know, shall we say there's the city, there's the people campaign, and then the, there's the wonk campaign to say. Yeah. And it, I mean, can this be more inclusive? I, I'm conscious that that this is that we're only uh, uh, you know we're not as diverse here on this panel as we might like to be. Mm -hmm. um, are we in? Are you able to, as Richard suggested, can you build a movement that is much more representative of who Canada is and who Canada has been and all that kind of thing? Um, how do we wrestle it away from lawyers, policymakers, old white people like me? Yes. How do we? Uh, uh, and I. I believe that it's it's happening. <laughs> I you know I believe that the I mean some of the idea about uh, power to the people, the the idea of accountability. I mean the great talk about uh, the policing, changing the policing framework that we had this afternoon uh, was wonderful in a sense of concrete solutions to actually you know. Uh, make a real change that that could change lives that could save lives uh, uh on top of everything else so so i think they're like always it's not going to be one solution no. people will will work with what they have they will do what they can and i i mean i, I was pleased and i can see I, I see that continuously in in the chat the idea of you know model legislation uh you know, uh, uh, matter and form uh, ideas, you know, pushing the ideas a little bit further, you will get a politician that will think that makes sense for uh, for him, her, or they, and 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 go uh, with that. So, you know, it, it, in law reform, which is where I come from, you know, you prepare all sorts of alternatives and someday there's a crisis and somebody wants, <laughs> <laughs> wants your solution, but, the, your role is to make sure that you've explored fully all the, the options, solution, all the, all the options, options, but also all the drawbacks. You know, there's no panacea in any of this. You know, so you have to just uh, present honestly as the the limits of the solutions, but the possibilities of the solution. So I guess this is part of the dilemma. You know, you think change the constitution, it means oh one change. Mm. then everybody got that. But what actually I think Alex is saying so was Richard and so did Alan at the beginning is that we need little experiments, which means, I mean, I wonder if we need to move off the idea of changing the constitution and move more to human rights cities, things that are that are grounded in the local. And then if that requires some kind of constitutional adjustment, fair enough. But but what you're driving for is the local change, the, the local autonomy, I guess is what we're, is it, is that what we're ultimately about is more local autonomy for local governments? Well, it certainly is more local autonomy with the the ability to deliver. So, you know, I think okay, that this, with yeah, no, so I, I I actually, you know, I think uh, uh, Zach Taylor presented it well, where, you know, you need fiscal capacity, you need legal, legal authority, a form of immunity, which is, you know, you, you cannot be overruled all the time because then you right. won't do anything. But so, uh, so, so that's, but my point here is that the, um, 
uh, I think there's an English expression that the, the, the horse is out of the barn or something, Yeah. <laughs> which, which means like the ideas are out there. Yeah. Uh, there is a charter uh, city movement uh, that's developing. Uh, what are some of the ideas that are around here that could support it? Uh, how to uh, uh, continue this conversation? Are there other avenues that could be taken? I mean, in, in uh, arguments in front of the courts, are they new ideas that could be pushed so that eventually uh, there is a re people are receptive to, to these new ideas? The human rights framework for cities could be a way to rally a, a, a much bigger group that you know mm -hmm. may not care too much about uh, power to the city, but they would care about the human rights city. I guess that that's it. I mean, if if you know, it's a question I keep bouncing in my head: is would if cities had more autonomy, if they had more authority, if they had more resources, would we have would we have coped with COVID differently? Just as just as the global pandemic that's before us. So, because I think, Alan, I'm interested about your perspective. I mean, you live in Stratford. Uh, we've had experiences where small cities and small mayors, mayors of small cities, not small mayors, mayors of smaller cities, um, mm -hmm. want these powers too, right? Do, do you have a sense of, is this a conversation only about really large jurisdictions? Or do you think it's a conversation about every municipal unit or a variety of municipal units? Have you thought about that? I have, and, and I don't think it can be just about, you know, the 22 largest cities in, in the country. I mean, there are 3,600 cities, you know, across Canada, cities, towns, villages that, that get money from the gas tax, for example. Um, you mentioned Stratford. Stratford, um, is doing a, a pilot, a test on autonomous vehicles in the whole city. And, but it, it's, it's structured in such a way to be able to do that. I think that one of the, uh, the challenges for a charter city movement is that different cities are gonna have different capacities to take on different respons responsibilities. Swedish cities are responsible for their hospitals within their borders. You know, would the city of Stratford wanna be responsible for the operation of you know, Stratford General Hospital. But Alan, could they opt in? Like could, well, so, well, that's could, what I'm so like no charter needs to be the same, right? Whatever well, the exactly. vehicle is. Okay. I think it's it's like a menu. It's like, right. here are a, a variety of responsibilities and here are the resources, you know, from the province, from the federal government that you're going to be able to, you're going to need to take on those responsibilities. Toronto or Vancouver, Montreal will want to take on a lot more because they have you know, bigger problems or they have more capacity. Stratford or Owen Sound or Moose Jaw or, or, or Squam, you know, or, 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 or Whistler won't be able to take on those things, but they should have the ability to take on some things. Or do they have the option, be important. But, but do they have the option to choose? I guess that's the question. They should, you're, kind of, you're kind of building from the ground. Up. I mean, Richard, you come from a jurisdiction that doesn't like rules and, and it's, or you're, mm -hmm. you don't come from, but you're living in one. And, and yet there are lots of people that would say that when there are fewer rules, you actually see a more vibrant, organic self-organizing happening. Do you, do you think that part of what we would be doing here is liberating a lot more innovation, a lot more innovative ways to solve problems? I, th I, think, I think quite possibly. So the US Constitution um, enumerates powers for the national government and everything else is left to the state. So that's right. one way to design a constitution, which leaves a lot of latitude for the states and the cities, if the states permit them, uh, to, to, to do what they need to do. But you see, the problem here is that there's a first mover problem, right? Uh -huh. Innovate, someone has to take the reins and innovate. And the first person to do that runs the risk of failure, but also runs the risk of success. And then when success happens, as inevitably it will, that offers political cover for those who may wish to join the movement and wish to innovate in their own jurisdictions. So that's the problem. You mentioned provincial constitutions, Mary, a, a moment ago. There's a lot of interest in this in, in Canada. Uh, I've, I've been asked to consult with premiers about this, so I know people are thinking about it um, really quite seriously. Uh, now, to what end is a different question. We might not like the ends for which people want to codify their constitutions, but the point is that that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do something to, to, to liberate cities, to allow them to to do the things that we want them to do and to do to do well. But I think the key is this first mover problem. Who wants to be the first, right? Who wants to, 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 to run the risk? Listen, we tried last night to see if Brian Bowman would yes. run for premier. They tried, believe me, they're trying to recruit him, but, uh, or somebody, those retiring mayors, they haven't got anything to do, they could run. Uh, maybe it's you, Richard, you need to come back to Canada. 
<laughs> just saying. Um, oh, well, today, today here in Austin, it's 31 degrees Celsius. I'm yeah, okay, rough. Yeah, okay. There you go. Yeah. Um, uh, Janet's asking an interesting question in the chat, and I think it, it leads to something broader, but she's, you know, I'd be interested to hear from the four of you. We haven't got that much longer, but we can have a little go still. What do you think didn't get covered that you think needs to, and I guess it informs your next steps, but um, are there are there topics that in, in retrospect or perspectives that you didn't get surface that you think need to? And Janet's raising a question about the historic role of school boards and their constitutional uh, role. You know, <laughs> the history of, of school boards in this country is fundamental to the way the country's organized. So um, do you want to, anybody want to, who wants to start and comment on that? about the school board piece for Janet. And then um, another question about what do you think didn't get covered that should, and if anybody else in the chat wants to put up something about something you thought should have got covered, put it in we'll, and they'll all have a go. Who wants to talk about school boards? J Alan. Well, not specifically about school boards, but the few times that the constitution, that, that the government has used section 43 of the single province amendment have been around education in Quebec <laughs> and Newfoundland. So certainly there are issues that are specific and perhaps you know school boards and how they're structured could be part of that emphasis. But there, there's it shows that you can use Section 43, that single province amendment, to to make changes to the constitution. Now, I know that's not specific to what Janet was asking, but um, that would be something that I would point to to say it's been used, it's been used successfully. Mm -hmm. It could be one of those many paths that we need to explore a lot further to see okay. how we get cities involved. So in is fact, there more wiggle room? Seven times, so it's actually the most popular, right. the most popularly used amendment procedure uh, in Canada. Okay. Anybody want to respond to Janet's plea about what about school boards? Well, I. I or sorry, Natalie, go, go. You go ahead. No, no, go, go. I want to talk to something else. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Alex. I mean, I think I think Janet raises a really good point that comes back to this question of the invisibility of local boards and municipalities in the constitution. Uh, because we know that 150 years plus after Confederation, that what we see on the ground is the important governing institutions aren't the ones that are reflected in our constitutions. And we don't have, you know, the, the, the antiquated, I, I call these the tattered pages of the constitution and offended some constitutional colleagues. So I apologize to anyone else out there who's offended, but you know, they're, they're literally like fraying at the edges, right? They don't reflect right. the reality of how governance actually looks. I mean, the, the question of who's missing. So who's missing is another invisible governance system, which are all of the grassroots efforts that exist within Mm -hmm. cities. You know, we have people like Andrea Reimer and others. We have folks who work on Indigenous planning issues who are participating in this. You know, there are so many methods of governance that are out there that aren't reflected in pieces of legislation or in the Constitution. And that's where I think the next set of conversations needs to go, is to figure out what is happening within cities beyond just the city government to really get a sense of what needs to be protected through law and and or not law um so that's where i think we we that's we didn't hear a lot about that but that's what i think is an important part of the conversation yeah we so i like this invisible notion like there are invisible it's like codes you know we have social codes that are pretty invisible too uh you you know you borrow a cup of sugar your neighbor brings you a cup of sugar that kind of stuff so uh, I'm interested if there are other ways that are actually, as you're suggesting, stitching together the way we actually function and that the constitution actually doesn't touch so much of how we operate, right? Um, um, I'm, Jan and I, I really tried. I, I tried to get a couple of people to tackle school boards, but you're <laughs> lucky that John Sewell's on the chat and he has an answer for you on school boards in the chat. Thanks, John. Natalie, you had another point you wanna raise. Well, actually, I, I, it was a little bit this idea that, uh, what's left, uh, I yeah. mean, lots is left uh, to, to, uh, to do. I think uh, we know that there are some issues that need to uh, get uh, deeper. I think some of the papers will uh, get deeper in this, but I, so, you know, for example, I think the, the, the manner in form uh, ID, uh, the equalization ID, the subsidiarity ideas, you know, we want to make sure that we have all the legal brains uh, that that is ready and willing and able to 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 be used for for the project or reflecting what what could be really needed. So so I think that's that's to, to be done. And then I, I would say the piece of innovation on on social policy 
is big for me. I, I thought the reason why this policing discussion was so interesting is that the opportunity to rethink really in, in, in bold ways how we think about policing could be done in other areas. You know, have we thought about housing differently? I think one of the mayors said, oh yeah, like we never thought we could uh, could put people in a hotel, but actually we can, we just did. You know? so, so I think that everybody says that, that COVID is an opportunity for change, for dramatic change, for, for bold uh, uh, opinion. So I, I believe that that's why all of us mm -hmm. have an opportunity to actually st step the action and step the reflection and step whatever talents we can bring to the table. So, so anyway, I just, uh, I, I, I just want to put that place that there are, certainly I think we haven't finished thinking about uh, new ideas and new, new people that should have been invited. You know, every time you organize a conference at the end, you say, oh yeah, what about, you know, what about this angle that we didn't? So uh, ongoing. Because that's, that's to, the next to, book. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I mean, I and I listen. I I think the fact that you guys are you know um, in academia and and making the straddle anyway is just um, is important. You know, again, it's a it's part of the evolution of how we understand higher ed and the role of post secondary, mm -hmm. which is actually increasingly located in the heart of cities and is being confronted with all the tangible challenges of cities. D do you think that you can make the case, whether it's human rights, whether it's constitutional change, can you make the case? to a person, an activist, um, a parent who is disturbed by what is going on around them, that this kind of change and reform will make life better? Yes, I think uh, uh, I, I do believe that not making that change will make life worse. <laughs> so, okay. I, I, so, so uh, you know, the, the, I think the, the idea of whether good governance give good results and whether the right people will, will not distort their functions and will continue to do the things in the public good, that's a bigger question. So I think you can never offer guarantees on this. But the failure of good governance, a little bit what uh, Rand Herschel is saying, the failure of considering this means that you are preventing cities from actually doing and probably not doing, not not doing enough, but maybe not doing uh, the basic that's necessary. So, mm -hmm. so my sense is, is it's always like this. And I think in, in life is, uh, what's the cost of doing nothing? <laughs> Would be yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, we had that Jean-Pierre very poignant beginning when he talked about Tunisia. Yeah. And just sort of reminded us that, that if you're real in a people. Yeah. real people, and if you're in a fa if you're state, if you're in a failed state, then the local becomes all the more critical in terms of restoring, rebuilding, creating trust again. I've had my own very modest experiences of this in uh, North American cities that were devastated by a particular event. And it was only the local that restored people's sense of trust in any sense of collective public good because the, the state and the national were way too far away. So I guess, do we have to wait for that to happen for us to fail? It, it, you know, there are people who are suggesting that federalism has failed through COVID and that the vaccine rollout, for instance, is a failure, demonstrates that failure. So I don't know whether you're gonna have your moment. If, if in the net, we've only got a few more minutes, so I wanna just go each to each of you and say, the un, sort of the unfinished business that you want us to tackle next. Natalie, of course, has uh, is, is relentless around these things. She's got endless energy, and so she's going to keep this ball going. Uh, so she's interested in what people's propositions are. Um, next set of steps, Alan. Next week, what are you going to be focusing on? Um, to, something that the mayor of Gatineau said. Um, he said that the when when provincial or federal uh, programs fail, who do people call? They call city hall. They yeah. call the mayor, they call their city councilor. Yeah. So I'm struck that that's the closest to the people. But on the other hand, half the people don't vote in municipal elections. So for me, if we're going to engage people, we've got to show them that we've got to change this culture that we look to, you know, this paternalistic kind of way of looking at things that we look to upper levels of government, you know, to guide us. I think it's got to be from the ground up. It's got to be from, from grassroots. Um, where we've got to say, no, cities matter, and here's why they matter to the success of provinces and, and the country. 
and then galvanize. That's what I'll be doing. So Alan, saying, right, Alan, we, Alan, yeah. Alan, if you did, if you just talked about this, I mean, part of it is I'm going to vote locally if I think it matters. Exactly. And, and the problem is I don't think it matters. Now, if you take Natalie's point about policing, mm -hmm. everybody's concerned about policing. Right. So if you could see real local leadership and local experimentation and change to fix policing, yep. would people would people show up? Natalie, what do you think? Well, I think the, the point was made today about uh, people are not stupid. They, uh, they are going to vote when it matters. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, good projects uh, elicit votes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's uh, incumbent on, on the political, the, uh, everyone. I mean, I would say you run, <laughs> start thinking about running, you know, uh, but it's- Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think that's probably part of a strategy is, are you gonna, I mean, Bowman says, let's have a provincial pilot. Are you, and I mean, I know there are people on this discourse here who have been saying this mm -hmm. for a long time. How do we, that's why I was so impressed. You had so many young people. So how do we get young people willing, engaged, Somebody, Kristen could made this good point that school boards were the way women got into the civic life. Um, how do we get more women, more folks that are really active on the equity sides of these discussions into the, into the problem solving? What about you, Alex? What are you gonna think about next week? So two things. Um, so going forward, we have lots of ideas. We're gonna be you know, kind of fleshing out what the next steps are to make uh, the policies and ideas that have come out of this, uh, out of this conference real. Uh, but the two that are especially inspiring to me, um, the first is grassroots efforts. So I, I actually disagree a little bit with what I, not to say that you said this, Mary, but I think you said it. So I'll just say I'm disagreeing Go. with you. Um, I think people do care. I think young people do care and they do show up. And I think a lot of people care about what happens at the municipal scale and do show up and do vote. I mean, you know, you and I have both seen how many people come and give deputations. I'm in the city of Vancouver now. You know, meetings could take days because of how many people, including from places like the downtown east side, where it's a real struggle to actually depute and be part of change, um, take part. Oh yeah. So, but so, but isn't it still the lowest turnout in terms of voting of the three orders of government? Isn't yeah, it the lowest yeah. municipal yes. turnout? No, yep. I don't know. There's Absolutely. There's been times when the mayoral uh, vote, like how many people vote for the mayor is higher than how many people vote at the federal level. You know, it depends, it changes okay. every time, but you know, people yeah, care yeah. anyway. So yeah I, think, I, I, yeah, I agree with you. I'm not suggesting people don't care. Yeah, yeah. So I think looking at the grassroots efforts um, is, is one area that's really important. And then the second, even though I, I said, you know, chisel and hammer, I think looking at the legal side of things, like what can cities do to push back against interference at the provincial scale. I don't think we have enough creativity huh. around law. Resistance, resistance. And, and at the university level, I don't think we um, have mobilized in that way um, to bring cases forward that bring together academics and others from outside of law to push for change in that forum, which can make real differences too, um, including in the area of human rights. So those are the two that that I really care about uh, in terms of next steps. You know, looking at your cherry blossoms behind you, uh, I'm just so struck by the challenge of climate. And we've got some folks in the chat in the chat who are really concerned about transition and climate. And the case that climate won't be will be won or lost in our cities. Cities are the ones that can actually make the changes to actually address climate. Do you think an issue like that, where we know we have broad support in the younger population? Could that be the way to get people to move forward with this autonomy discussion and say that's how we'll solve climate? Well, if there was a, 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 a proposal that people cared about and they saw objections from the top to what they right. believed. I mean, the, the city of Victoria uh, uh, ban on plastic that got, gets thrown out, uh, you know, uh, I think that raised a lot of, of, of eyebrows about saying, listen, I campaign to the city, and then it gets uh, it gets uh, ignore or overturn. So my sense is, it's concrete uh, um, issues like this will bring uh, people to the for, uh, the the, the, for, the front. But I I, um, I just so I think that's that's that always happens. You know, there's a concrete issues. There's mm -hmm. something that you care about, and then you see, oh well, there's there's lots of aspects to this issue. If I want to get all the things that I think are, are important for it mm -hmm. to, to succeed. Um, 
Yeah. No. Richard, I want to come to you and then I'm going to go to Natalie for the last word. So Richard, mm -hmm. any final thoughts from you from the balmy metropolis of Austin? <laughs> well, you asked uh, earlier uh, in our session, Mary, if I was, if I am a lawyer, I am indeed, and I used to be a corporate uh, attorney at an international law firm here in the United States. And what I found quite interesting when I worked at this law firm was that if I was given a matter to work on, I could go into a firm database and find precedent. So copies of things that my colleagues, predecessors and existing colleagues had prepared in terms of briefs or memos. And I could use that, repurpose that material for the things that I was working on. So that leads me to an idea to respond to your question about what's next. I'd love to be able to gather some of the people that we've had in conversation today to have drafting sessions. So imagine a session with Kristen Good and Emmett McFarlane and Hoy Kong talking about the matter and form requirement and trying to draft a provincial statute, for example, a constitution that straddles the boundary that doesn't exceed it, but that finds a way to do it lawfully consistent with the constitution. I'd love to sit in on that and just listen to them debating that. Or imagine you want to do something else like draft a, a charter uh, for a charter city. I'd love to see that. So to go from the theoretical down to the nitty gritty of implementation, mm -hmm. there's been both in this conference. We've had some high level discussions and also some nitty gritty, but mm -hmm. I think in order to make it possible and easier for political actors to take the next steps, they need a batch of precedent like I had when I was a corporate attorney so that I don't have to start from scratch. All right, so you're in the precedent business. That was altar call number two there, just saying. And uh, I can see they're just, oh, the, the people in the chat are really dying to do this with you, Richard. So I'm sure uh, <laughs> they're going to be uh, hands up all over the place. All right, last word to you, uh, uh, Principal de Rossier, as you uh, round us well, up and that's carry true. this forward. So uh, first, uh, obviously, I, I just want to thank everybody in the chat that has all these good ideas. I think uh, we do want to create uh, model legislation, model intergovernmental uh, agreements and and uh, uh, but I want to thank uh, I want to thank you Mary and and uh, uh, thank particularly your organizations for being partner with us uh, on this it's been uh, wonderful really helpful uh, I want to thank uh, your team uh, Selena Zhang and uh, Jamie Bazin who's made us sure that we were able to uh, to do this in a virtual way. I want to thank our student rapporteur, uh, who uh, you will see the work that they've done uh, be wonderful. I want to thank also the Massey team that's been uh, helping out, Matt Glanfin, Alyssa Gainsbourg, all the conférenciers and conférencières, all the people that uh, gave paper, that uh, commented on papers. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank, obviously, my uh, partners in crime here, uh, Alan, Kirsten, Alexandra, and, and Richard, and also Darren Cho, who created the visual for this uh, conference, which was uh, a, a work of art as far as I want to thank our advisory council many of them participated not only in giving papers or our um, uh, chairing session uh, Hoy Khan and Golden Kristen Good uh, Anami Paul uh, Brian Kelsey Mary Ebert Saran Urshaw Sitaranka Lawasing Init Slack uh, Ratna Midvar Claire Boyshik uh, Signa Don Shanks, Graham Fox, and Zach Taylor, and Jeff Cape. Thank you very much for your good wisdom along the way. Uh, and finally, I think uh, I certainly want to thank uh, the Maytree Foundation and the uh, Shirk uh, Social Science uh, Humanities for their financial support. We wouldn't be here without them. Alors, merci beaucoup, Miigwech. It's been such a wonderful time. I do. I do like the virtual, but I, for now, I think I would really like to invite everybody to have, uh, uh, to meet at Massey and celebrate together this great work. Uh, let's do it next year. Rain check. It's called a rain <laughs> check <laughs> to the quadrangle next time. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us and thanks for a great three days. We've all learned a ton, uh, but as we always say, you know, this is just, isn't the end of the conversation. It's the beginning of the conversation. So thanks again for all your leadership. And I look forward to whatever uh, Massey and her and the company assembled here that are mm -hmm. Natalie's colleagues uh, put together for the next round. So thanks very much. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thanks everyone.